I've had a few listeners suggest that they'd love to see a tour of the operation here at Geek Therapy Radio, and I couldn't be happier to oblige. I'll show you the radio station where I work, and then we'll move on to my home setup. But before we dive in, let me just make clear for anybody interested in making a podcast themselves, you don't need any of this to make a good podcast. Most of you have everything you need in your pocket. Phone microphones have come a long way, as have audio editing apps. I recorded, edited, and sent an entire radio show back to the radio station using just my phone and absolutely nothing else. I'll link to it in the video description. Outside of a smartphone, any USB microphone, and any computer from the last 20 years with a USB port is more than enough to produce a polished podcast. I just wanted to point that out in hopes that it may ease any fear that equipment is the only thing holding you back. You likely have a phone or a computer. The only true limitation, like a lot of creative endeavors in life, is lack of motivation. You know, plopping a musician in a million-dollar studio or podcast or in a million-dollar radio station is useless without having something to say and the motivation to say it. I'm not sure how motivational that was, but hopefully it helped at least some of you who have thought about starting a podcast. The biggest hurdle is always to just start. So anyway, let's start the tour, and we'll start at my day job in the radio station. My full-time job is radio board operator for 740 KTRH and co-producer slash phone screener for The Michael Berry Show. I'll show you some of the gear in the radio station and some of what I do, but it will not be exhaustive, and I won't give away anything proprietary. So let's start with the radio board. It is similar, but different from a typical audio mixing console. In simplest terms, a radio board controls different sources of information from different media sources, whereas an audio mixing board allows for the manipulation of the audio itself with EQ, compression, and special effects, and so on. On a radio board, only one source of audio is typically on at a time. One channel controls the anchor's microphone, another channel a feed from ABC, Fox, NBC, etc., while another controls the feed from the traffic reporter, audio from the anchor's computer, and so on. I use the various buttons to play our own local commercials, make sure local news anchors make it on the air, join syndicated radio shows, and so on and so forth. Here, let's watch how I conduct a typical news break. This is a typical bottom-of-the-hour news. Weather, traffic, plus breaking news 24 7. This is News Radio 740, KTRH, and High Heart Radio Station from the Gallery Furniture Made in America studios. It may be a while before there's a coronavirus vaccine. I'm Scott Crowder. It's 12 30 on News Radio 740, KTRH. Traffic and weather together. Here's Sky Mike. All right, we're still dealing with that big problem on the south side, Scott Crowder. That is a rollover accident. This is pretty serious stuff. South Loop westbound at I-45 hazmats there. There's a fuel spill, and we are just completely stopped in traffic from Old Galveston Road. An extra 14 minutes going westbound. If you're coming in from 225, do yourself a favor. Take the east loop northbound. Get around that. I'm Sky Mike in the Gulf Coast Windows.com 24-hour traffic center. Tracking some rain showers on weather radar. Most of the returns have been on the north side, and they're moving northeast away from us. And it's a cooler tone here for the midweek forecast. Gets even cooler for tomorrow. Upper-level weather energy keeping some gray skies around behind our cold front that came in yesterday. We're at 60 today, 50 tonight with some light showers. And a few morning showers. News Radio 740, KTRH. Sponsored by Publishers Clearing House. This is the last chance alert. In just days, Publishers Clearing Now let's look closer at some buttons and equipment. These buttons play commercials and other audio elements off of the computer. These meters tell me what the board is sending out, what the digital audio stream to Alexa and the iHeartRadio app is doing, and what is going out over the 50,000 watt broadcast antenna. This machine handles the audio delay. It is usually set for 10 seconds, but is turned off during sporting events. When it's on, the listener hears what comes off the board 10 seconds after it happens, so we can catch any F-bombs and such. When it is disabled during sporting events, that's when you can sometimes hear players or other people in the crowd dropping F-bombs. Hey, it happens. The exit button disables the delay and the audio goes back to real time. 
flying without a safety net. Start begins to build the buffer up to 10 seconds, cough allows you to chew into the delay for up to 10 seconds, and dump erases the last 10 seconds of audio and starts building the buffer again. We hit the dump button if a radio show caller says the F word, for example. Think of this machine kind of like the anti-skip on an old portable CD player. It stores 10 seconds of audio that you can pull from when the CD gets jostled. Except here, the jostles are F-bombs and covering up a cough or a sneeze. I won't go into extreme detail about this machine, but it is the source of EAS alerts. It's the emergency alert system. Those loud, annoying tones and messages that interrupt your TV, radio, and even your phone when severe weather or a disaster is on the way. If you're anywhere around Houston and one of those alerts interrupts you while you're watching The Bachelor, yeah, sorry, that's me. And this is the machine overriding every TV and radio station in the area to do it. I tried to write Godzilla as one of the disasters, but the engineer didn't let me. Oh well. I won't even attempt to explain in depth what this machine does, but clues are in the name. It's called the 25-7. It lets you squeeze 25 hours of audio into a 24-hour day. It's audio time compression. More effectively, it lets you squeeze a few extra minutes of audio into an hour. It isn't used all the time, it's just basically another safety net. The main audio monitors are industry standard Mackie HR824s. We'll see them again later on as well. Almost every recording studio and broadcast facility has at least one pair of HR824s. Matter of fact, every TV show, every movie, and every commercial music production you have ever heard in the last 25 years or so has passed through a pair of HR824s. They're kind of like the old Yamaha NS10s. They are absolutely everywhere. These particular HR824s have not been turned off ever in the last 10 years at least. These are the exact same speakers we've had in here since I started 10 years ago. They seriously are never turned off. That's at least 10 years of constant, never ceasing audio every second of every day for a decade. Yes, they are reliable and will give you heart palpitations if you crank them. There's really no need for a subwoofer, and HR824s are THX certified. These little Fostex 6301Bs are used as cue monitors, usually for editing audio off the computer and listening to YouTube videos. They've also never been turned off in the last 10 years. That's crazy. Looking out the window, you can see the 610 Loop and the Galleria area of Houston. It's one of the trendy shopping areas of our city. Avoid it like the plague, unless you work here or you're just a tourist. The microphones we use are also industry standard, Electro Voice RE27NDs to be exact. Modern successors to the legendary RE20. So for my audio geeks, they have about 6 dB more gain than RE20s and less proximity effect among other improvements. Matter of fact, you're listening to it right now. Here's me two inches from the microphone. Here's me a foot back from the microphone. Not too shabby. I'm back on the mic now. Since moving into my house and setting up my own studio, I record my podcast in here less and less. But when I do, I arm the channel and record into Adobe Audition. So yeah, when I record podcast stuff at the radio station, I just record raw into Audition and then upload the audio to Dropbox, then put the show together at home or on my laptop using Cakewalk Sonar. More on that later. So that was the radio station. Let's cruise over to what I got going on at home, where most of the magic happens. So right off the bat, this isn't a tour of my home. I gotta keep some things sacred and private, understandably, but here are a couple things worth noting on our way upstairs. Of course, the garage is where Lauren sleeps, my 1983 DeLorean DMC-12. Click up there to see a complete tour of her up close, but in brief, I bought her back in the year 2000, July actually, for less than a used Honda Civic. I actually delivered pizza with her for two years and still take every opportunity to stretch her legs. She fires up every single time. That's not bad for a car that's almost 40 years old and completely unrestored beyond some fuel and brake lines. Now there's a lot of myth and legend surrounding this car, but after 40 years, she still runs great. Basic maintenance is a lost art, but it's the reason cars like these can last forever. 
I just erased three extra paragraphs about the difference between modern and old cars, so let's reel it in a little bit and move on. I hesitate to show you my solar setup, but here it is. It ain't pretty, but it works. It's a temporary setup anyways. I used it to keep my lawnmower, vacuum, tablets, power tools, smartphone, drones, and various other things charged. It's just fun knowing that my yard is entirely maintained by the energy from the sun. Ultimately, I'd like to make my entire home solar, but yeah, that little money thing tends to get in the way. Rounding out the garage is my 8-inch Orion reflector telescope and, of course, a Ryu poster. Or Ryu, whatever you pronounce it. Now, let's go inside. Here's an old radio record player combo my grandfather bought back in the 1960s. It's completely gutted. I may restore it one day, but I love it. It has AM, FM, and the most fascinating thing, shortwave for international broadcasts. Now, shortwave is a faint glimmer of what it once was, naturally. Not many stations remaining around the world, but some are still out there. So under the TV in the living room, of course I've got a Nintendo Switch, uh, an Alexa, NVIDIA Shield, and for some reason a PlayStation 2. Rounding things out is an old 5 GHz router for Wi-Fi, though my computer, Shield TV, and even Switch are hardwired with Cat6 Ethernet to the modem. I'm not an animal. The modem and router are also plugged into battery backup, theoretically to reduce resetting the internet after every time the power goes out, but that might be debatable. Audio, for some glorious reason, is routed through a Mackie big knob and finally through some awesome KRK Rocket 5s I got back in 2006 or 2007. The Behringer compressor only applies to any audio coming out of the TV for when I'm lazy and don't want to constantly adjust volume in movies where huge loud action scenes are immediately followed by actors whispering. Usually it's bypassed though. Again, only actually compressing audio when I'm being lazy or it's late. Now at the top of the stairs is my crown jewel, my arcade machine. I can do an entire video about this, but basically it's a gutted Konami cabinet. It was an Ajax ca uh, cabinet or Ajax, however you want to pronounce it from 1980s, with a PC inside running Steam, MAME, and other emulators. At the time I built it, there weren't any Street Fighter 4 arcade machines in the city, so I built one because, you know, geek. I sourced a Street Fighter 2 marquee and slapped it in the Konami cabinet, sacrilege I know, but I freaking love this thing. Clint from LGR and I just did a show about arcades and arcade machines. I'll link it in the video description for anyone curious. The 8-bit guy and Colin from This Does Not Compute joined me as well. And another little reflector telescope here on the bookshelf. Speaking of, you want to see a picture I took of the moon intersecting with Jupiter back in July of 2013? Well, here you go. I'm super proud of it. Best picture I've ever taken. I use that 8-inch scope you saw in the garage in an old cheap Nikon DSLR. Okay, let's move into the home studio where I do 90% of the work for Geek Therapy Radio. There's a modest futon in back for playing some classics on a CRT. Mostly I just emulate through the Wii, but I do have some old systems available we'll look at in a moment. Next to the futon is the closet. I mainly use it for storage. Here's a bunch of old computer parts, including cases, motherboards, and other bits. This is also where my guitar amps live. It's cool to be able to turn up the amp a bit for recording, but then be able to close the door and keep the sound level down in the rest of the house. Now my main guitar bay is the Schecter Damien with the annoying but awesome Floyd Rose tremolo that's hanging above the futon. But here's the guitar wall with some of the rest of my and my wife's guitars. I've always wanted to create a space with all of my tools within reach. Speaking of tools, we'll get to those in a moment, but here's the mini museum, as I call it. It's where I keep all of my old consoles and vintage computers. We have the SNES, NES, Wii, GameCube, Xbox, and of course anything else. I also keep my fight sticks up here along with my tablets, old laptops, various handhelds, and of course, Game Boy Collection. Mm. So this is just where my stuff returns to roost, basically. Ask my wife where all of my toys wind up around the house. A Game Boy in the nightstand, a PSP on the coffee table, a walkie-talkie on the kitchen counter. My stuff wanders around. I try to blame it on the cats, but my wife sees through it. 
Below the mini museum are most of my various parts and odds and ends. Some drawers contain repair tools, some have AV cables, some have various computer bits. It's just a reasonably organized hodgepodge of things I like to tinker with. This bookcase has my beloved Atari ST, Commodore 64, and other bits along with my microphone collection and some other odd things. My goal is to have at least one computer to represent each era. So down here is a Pentium 3 Dell laptop and a Pentium 4 Dell desktop, Windows 98 and Windows XP respectively. The laptop is awesome for DOS gaming and other legacy programs, including Planet X3 by the 8-bit guy. And gotta keep a CRT around for full authenticity, of course. Holy crap, this video is turning out to be way longer than I thought. But you'll forgive me, right? I like showing you all my geeky stuff. So let's start wrapping the video with the pinnacle of my geekiness. My production setup and PC battle station. Well, here it is. The brains of the operation is my PC. State-of-the-art 2015, it's got an Intel Core i7-4790K overclocked to a modest 4.5GHz across all cores, 32GB of DDR3 RAM at 2400MHz, a GTX 980, and a splatter of SSDs and hard drives. I'm saving up to do an AMD build around the 16-core 3950X. Just saving for what I need and using what I can salvage from my current build. So basically just CPU, motherboard, and DDR4 RAM. Everything else can carry over. Only money I'm putting towards it is whatever I earn from YouTube and Patreon. So it may take a little bit, but believe me, I am 100% happy with what I do have. It is more than most have, so no complaints and definitely no rush. Anyways, my monitor is my late father's 70-inch Vizio overclocked to 110 hertz. On a morbid note, this was the TV he was watching when he died. After that, it survived a flood, but still has some water stains on the right side between the layers of the screen. I can't really afford to throw money around willy-nilly on TVs and computer monitors, so I'm lucky to have this awesome TV regardless of its history. Here are my Mackie HR824s. The same as at the radio station and in every other studio in the world. I got them used off of eBay probably back in 2011, I think? Now between them is my favorite single piece of audio equipment ever. The Tascam 688 8-track cassette tape recorder. I showcased it in my last video, which you can click on up here. I don't use this day-to-day -day in production, but it's patched into the computer via a dedicated old M-Audio 1010 LT audio card for when I feel like bouncing audio tracks back and forth from tape to my audio software and vice versa. It sounds amazing to run drums and guitars onto and off of cassette tape. The 688 is just another paintbrush to work with when I feel like it. Let's move on to the main workhorse. My old Tascam 1641 USB audio interface. Now 9 times out of 10 when I record a podcast, it's just my old MXL V67G I bought in 2003, plugged directly into channel 1 of the interface and nothing else. The 1641 is handling all of the audio responsibilities of my computer. It also feeds the headphones and the Mackies, whether I'm gaming, watching Netflix, or doing audio production. If I'm feeling saucy, I do have some other outboard gear I can integrate. For instance, this is a prototype tube mic pre slash guitar amplifier from my friend Chris over at Handy Amps. He owns a business where he designs and builds custom studio gear like mic pre's, guitar amps, compressors, and more. I interviewed him a while back if you want to click up there and watch. This prototype is codenamed Everything, and he basically lent it out to me to quote, go nuts with it and take notes on how it works. So for tubes to sound and run their best, they need tons of electricity. Most tube crap you buy today runs cold biased at 12 volts. Maybe they run at 150 volts, maybe even 250 to 300 volts for hyper expensive boutique preamps. Chris dials his in per tube to their absolute maximum ability, usually upwards of 400 volts. He's a friggin' genius. Just the power supply he uses cost more than most mic pre's altogether at Guitar Center. I'm honored he has let me borrow this one. Anyways, next to the everything is a Pleb Universal Audio 4710D tube and solid state mic pre and interface. 
Yeah, believe me, this is exactly like saying, here's a million dollar Lamborghini next to a Bugatti Veyron. You feel superior in the Lambo until a Veyron pulls up. Occasionally, I'll patch either of these world-class Mike Prees into the Tascam 1641, but I haven't recently. It feels like overkill to run either of these Prees through a relatively cheap USB interface using a $100 MXL microphone. It's kind of like driving that Lambo and Veyron through a school zone. The last piece of outboard gear is the venerable Art Pro VLA 2 OptoTube compressor for when I feel like adding analog audio compression on the way into the computer. So powering absolutely everything is the ubiquitous Furman power conditioner. The power in this house is trash. It's a grounding nightmare, but ideal. The Furman at least smooths it out a little bit and protects my gear from a surge. The rest of my desk is home to my little Oxygen 8 MIDI controller, a light dusting of game controllers, my Sony WH-1000XM2s, and of course Corsair mechanical keyboard and gaming mouse. As mentioned before, I edit Geek Therapy Radio, and almost everything else I do with audio, in Cakewalk Sonar. For any audio geeks, here are my current compressor settings, and here are my EQ settings. These are completely arbitrary and fluctuate routinely, but these are just the settings I'm using right now. Usually I keep my compressor release time around 124 milliseconds for my voice, but for some reason right now I've set it to 75 milliseconds. Whatever. For video editing, I use Vegas. Video editing isn't my cup of tea, but I'm definitely learning more and more <laughs> pronunciation as I go. Maybe I might make the jump to Premiere or Final Cut or DaVinci at some point, but for now, it's Vegas. The video camera I use is the Canon EOS SL3 with the stock lens and a nifty 50 50mm 1.8 prime lens. Whew, I had no idea this video would wind up being so long, but turns out there was more stuff to show you than I anticipated. I hope you enjoyed peeking around things here at Geek Therapy Radio nonetheless. The podcast is available everywhere. Just look for the red, black, and white color scheme. But most importantly, know that you are worthy of love and your own self-respect. Thank you so much for watching. If you like the podcast or this channel, I'd be honored if you'd tell your friends about it or even call your local radio station and get it on the air in your neck of the woods. I'm always looking to syndicate. Remember that we're all geeks about something. So lean into your inner geek and I'll see you next time.